Hello, everybody. Ooh. Happy Friday afternoon. Um, here is the usual link to the attendance. Please go fill it out. Also, something else I thought I had. Maybe not. Maybe I'm just crazy. Let's see here. All right, I'm going to say the thing I always say. What should we do today? What do you guys have questions about? So I watched Rodriguez's class today. He started talking about directional derivatives, which we've already talked about a little bit. We can certainly talk about that more. I also looked at the notes, kind of, gosh, Rodmacher's handwriting leaves something to be desired. But I was looking at his notes, and he started talking about linear systems of equations. At least that's what's in his notes, um, which we could certainly start talking about. It kind of depends on what you guys want to do, though. All right, well, take a look here. James, I, yes. I was curious if you if you would like to look at um, if you would like to ha get a glimpse of um, my the homework that's being assigned for Rodriguez because I know how to yeah. find a way to turn into a PDF and then I could email you the PDF if, would you like me to do that in the future from now on? Okay, yes, thank you. Okay. Um, well, then let me actually grab one thing here because I have a couple of things. Could we work a little bit with chain rule? If totally, yeah. Right. Oh yeah, the chain rule, oh my gosh. Sure, let me just do one thing real quick here. Sorry, where'd you go? Okay, because I think we're going to want to start talking about. Yeah. All right. Yes, one moment. <laughs> um, yeah, 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 okay. There we go. I'm just thinking we're probably going to maybe start talking about linear systems of equations, so it might be good to have some examples ready to go. But yeah, we can definitely talk about the thing you just said that I totally remember and didn't just forget automatically, <laughs> which was called, um, <laughs> what was that again, Cameron? <laughs> <laughs> Chain rule. Chain rule, yeah. Um, okay, so, yes. Um, is it, can we also go a little bit over directional derivatives? I know that we talked a little bit about yeah, it in the past. Sure. Okay. So let me see. I know I've got actually I've got another book over here. Some chain rule questions. I mean, I've got a couple examples here, but I think I might have used them already. Mm -hmm. So let me just look real quick. Or not. There we go. Sure. Yeah, okay. So here are a couple of examples. Here's one example anyway. I'll do this example and then maybe I'll give you guys one to work on. So let's say we have this function of three variables. So w is a function of x, y, and z. And it's equal to x squared, y cubed, z to the fourth. And furthermore, y and z, x and z are both functions of s and t. So x as a function of s and t is um, s squared plus 3t. 
and y as a function of z, actually s and t is 4s plus sine of t. And z as a function of s and t, it's actually just a function of t, but all right. Um, is, where'd you go there? One plus t squared. And so the question we're, so clearly we could write w as a function of just s and t, right? We could write it as this quantity squared plus times this quantity cubed times this quantity squared. And we could totally find del z del t, right? The partial of this with respect to t by actually plugging it in and doing that. It would be a huge pain in the butt, right? If I was gonna, if I plugged in each of these functions and then took the derivative of that with respect to t, I'd have to use the triple product rule, I'd have to use the chain rule each time. It just looks messy. It's certainly doable. And in some sense, we're gonna do the same amount of work, but the way we're gonna do it is just gonna feel nicer. So, I'm oh, sorry, I said DZDT, I meant del W, del T, apologies. And so the way I learned to do this, at least when I was a student, is you kind of go by levels. So W at the first level is a function of X, Y, and Z. And then x, y, and z are functions of s and t at the next level. Now let's actually write, let's write the t, the s over here since z is, oh sorry, no, I have that the right way. Call them. S and t. So x is a function of both s and t, y is a function of both s and t, and z is just a function of t. So if I want to find del w del t, I have to add up all the paths from w to t. So it's going to be this path, which is del w del z times del z del t. This path, del w del y times del y del t. And this path, del w del x times del x del t. So we're going to add all those up together. Um, I think what we're actually doing is we're essentially dotting the gradients together. Like you could, you could totally say, right? So what? So here's what I'm going to get. I'm going to get del w del t equal to del w del x times del x del t plus del w del y times del y del t. Mm, that's not quite right, actually. That that's not quite the right way to say it. Plus del w But you can totally think of this as vector, two vectors being dotted together. It's the vector, it's the gradient of W, which is just the partials of W with respect to X, Y, and Z, dotted with the partials of X, Y, and Z all with respect to T, which I don't know what you call that. It'd be dotted with Right. You could totally write it this way if you wanted to. I don't think it's really necessary. I just think it's worth pointing out because we are doing a lot of, or we're about to be doing a fair amount of matrix multiplication. So this isn't, multi this isn't matrix multiplication. This is a vector dot product. But it'd be the same as matrix multiplication if we wrote this one as a row and then multiplied by that matrix there. So whatever. Anyway, in either event, we're going to calculate this, which is terrible. So I'm going to erase this to give myself a little bit of room. And if you if you didn't catch that, you can always look at the video later and pause it. Um, so del w del x is just going to be 2x times y cubed times z to the fourth times del x still t, which is just 3, plus del w del y is going to be x squared times 3y squared times z to the fourth times del y del t, which is just going to be cosine of t, plus del w del z, which is going to be x squared y cubed z to the it's not z to the fourth, times 4z cubed times del z del t, which is just 2t. So then the only thing we actually have to do, well, the only thing we should do, I don't know if we have to do it because I don't know why. 
times. And the only thing we would need to do next would be to plug in what X, Y, and Z were in terms of S and T, which is kind of gross, right? I'm going to do the first part and then I'm probably going to stop. So this would be 2 times 3, that's going to be 6 times X, which is S squared plus 3T times Y cubed, which is 4S plus sine of T cubed, right? So I'm right here, cubed, times Z to the fourth, and Z is 1 plus T squared. Plus, and then I do the same thing for, I'm not going to do it because it's too much writing. For this and for this, we just plug in what X and what Y were. But it's a lot better than plugging in first and then differentiating the whole thing using all these gross rules. It's a lot easier this way. So what I want you guys to try and do is find, and I'm going to give you a couple minutes while I look for another good problem. Find del W del S. So instead of all the paths to T, you have to find all the paths to get you to S. So go ahead and try that. It should take a minute or two. And I'm going to look for another good problem. So del W del S should have been a little bit nicer. Um, where to erase? I guess I'll erase here. No, I don't. I'm just going to go to the next side. So del W S should, should be you know, this times this and this times that. So there should just be two parts we're going to add together. Right? It's going to be del Y del X times del X del S plus, sorry, del W del X times del X del S plus del W del Y times del Y del S. And so, not enough room. So del W del X times del X del S plus del W del Y. So del, these first two parts are actually the same, right? The del Ws with respect to X and Y, those are the same as they were before. That's still this part here and this part here. So it's two x y cubes to the fourth. Times whatever the derivative of x with respect to x is plus sorry, the del w del y, which is x squared through y squared z to the fourth. times whatever del y del s is. So del x del s is 2s, del y del s is 4. And then we could go and plug in whatever x, y, and z are. So again, this would look like 2 times what x is, times y cubed, 
times z to the fourth times 2s plus again whatever x is squared times 3 times whatever y is squared times z to the fourth times 4. And you go back and plug those in, right? x is s squared plus 3t. And y is 4s plus sine of t. And z was 1 plus c squared. And that's kind of most of the idea when you're doing the chain rule is we're given kind of one function of some variables and then those variables as functions of some other variables and you kind of have to make this diagram. So let me, I guess, let me have you guys do the following. So they all, they all start to feel the same to me, but that doesn't mean they are the same to you. So, so for um for what it for what it's asking would you label as um the well del w over del s yeah this is del w del s okay yeah kind of gross. and are those the only two um that you could find from this well so, so, so these are the i mean Yes and no. They're the only two that make sense in that, right, at, at the very end, W is a function of just S and T, right? X, Y, and Z are kind of intermediate variables. Um, but you could totally also be asked to find del, del, I mean, we did find del, W, del, X, del, W, del, Y, del, W, del, Z. There's a lot of other partials that you could find. But these two partials, I would say, are the only ones that really require the chain rule, right? Any other partials in this chart, you could just calculate. Okay. And again, not that you couldn't calculate this directly, but here's what I'm talking about. So we're not going to do this. I just erased the thing I wanted to use. That's fine. I've got it over here. What we're doing with this, just so you guys are really clear on the fact, is that we are avoiding, well, come on, avoiding using the um, We are avoiding taking the derivative of s squared plus t squared squared times 4s plus sine t cubed times 1 plus t squared to the fourth. Right? Taking the derivative of this with respect to s or t, I mean, it's certainly possible. Right? We know how to use the product rule and the chain rule. It's just a real big mess. So you could do it this way, but the point is not here. OK. Um, there was actually one other thing I wanted to point out, because it's kind of well, it's, it might be somewhat worthwhile. This is this is kind of a corner case. It sometimes comes up. Well, let's talk about it. So, okay, where'd you go here for one second? Hmm, sorry, where's it missing? So let's say we had. How do I want to do this? I'm gonna do it this way. So let's say we have f of x, y equal to, this is not going to be really a chain rule problem, uh, y squared minus x squared minus sine of x, y. Yeah. And how am I doing this? Sorry. Sure. Let's do it that way. So I want to find the partials with respect to x and respect to y. So, so, so I'm going to show you guys something, which is kind of neat. So what's fx here? Well, <clears throat> fx is negative 2x minus the root of sine is cosine of my, sorry, that's x times y, not x comma y. That was crazy. Yeah, I don't know why I have x comma y there. Um, so the derivative of sine of some stuff is cosine of the stuff times the derivative of that stuff. The derivative of xy with respect to x is just y. Okay. And then fy 
is equal to, let's see, it's going to be 2y. Again, the derivative of sine of some stuff is cosine of the stuff times the derivative of stuff, which in this case is just x. Okay, great. Why am I talking about this? Well, the reason I'm talking about this is because you can actually use these things to find the derivative of y with respect to x without using implicit differentiation. So I'm going to actually look at a different question here. We're going to come back to this. So let's say I have this function, f of x, y equal to 0, or y squared minus x squared minus sine of x, y equal to 0. And I want to find dy dx, right? The regular derivative implicit differentiation like we did in 17a. So if I want to find dy dx, I'm going to use implicit differentiation. So derivative of y squared. So now I'm thinking of y as a function of x. So the derivative of oh, o, which means I might have to go back and be less stupid. I might have made a mistake. Let me double check. No, I think I'm all right. I'm just crazy. Yeah, OK. Yeah, I'm fine. Sure. So derivative here is going to be 2y times dy dx minus the derivative of x squared is 2x minus the derivative of sine of some stuff is cosine of the stuff. And now when we multiply the derivative of the stuff, we take the derivative of x times y. Or we're treating both x and y as variables that are both depending on x. So the derivative of x times y is 1 times y plus x times y prime. I'm, I'm going to write y prime here so I can be consistent. Sorry. And that's equal to 0. And now I'm going to solve for y prime. So I need to foil this out or distribute this to each of these terms. So I've got 2y y prime minus 2x minus y times cosine of xy minus x times y prime times cosine of xy equal to 0. Sorry, I know it's a little scrunched in there. So again, this is 2y y prime minus 2x minus y times cosine of xy minus xy prime times cosine of xy. And now I'm going to solve for y prime. So I'm going to bring these things, I'm going to leave these things on the same side. So I'm going to have 2y minus x, oops, sorry, I'm also factoring out the y prime as I go here. I'm going to have 2y minus x times cosine of xy. That's all times y prime. And that's this term and this term. Equal to, I'm going to bring this up over to the other side. So it's 2x plus y cosine of xy. And then look what I get. I get y prime equal to 2x plus y cosine of xy divided by 2y minus x cosine of xy. Or looking back over here, y prime is actually the negative of the partial with respect to x divided by the partial with respect to y. So here's what this tells us. If you ever have to find the derivative of y as a function of x implicitly, you can do it the normal way, right? You can do all this, or you can do it this way. We say, oh, I'm just going to find the partial. So you can set it equal to 0 then find the partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, and then solve for, and then find negative partial with respect to x divided by partial with respect to y. So let me give you one more example. Let me give you one short example, and then we'll move on to directional derivatives. So again, I don't know if this will really come up for you guys, but I know I've seen it come up in 17c before. So it's just kind of, it's nice to have in your back pocket. If someone says use implicit differentiation, you can also use this. So let's say, for example, I'm trying to make this not too hard. Let's say we have y cubed plus x to the fourth equal to x squared y to the fifth. Now I want to find dy dx. 
Okay, so the first thing we need to do is bring everything to one side. So I've got y cubed plus x to the fourth minus x squared y to the fifth equal to zero. And we're thinking of this left-hand side as our capital F of x comma y. And once we've done that, then we can say, oh, we know that dy dx is just going to be in every other this negative fx over xy. And then it's pretty straightforward. fx is super duper easy. It's 4x cubed minus 2xy to the fifth. Fy is also not too terrible. It's 3y squared minus 5y to the fourth times x squared. All I said is 5x squared y to the fourth. And then putting that together, dy dx should be the negative of this. So you can write negative 4x cubed plus 2xy to the fifth all over. Over that. It's a much faster way of finding the derivative implicitly, if that is what you're being asked to do. But it's only specifically for when you have this 17a type situation where you have x's and y's and only x's and y's jumbled up together and you would find the derivative implicitly. You can instead do this. This. <laughs> and Mm. Let me just say one more thing. Yeah, I feel like I should give you, so I don't like to just say things without giving reasons, right? You guys are like, cool, it's true, but why does it work is how I would feel about this if it were, if I were the student. So I feel like I should give you just a minor justification. It takes just a minute. So here's why it works. And grab a sip of water. So let's say we have, let's call w this function of x and y. And let's say it's equal to zero. And yeah. So since w is equal to zero, the partial, and, and sorry, I'll be honest, I haven't done this in a long time, so I'm like, okay, what's what the book say here? So the partial with respect to x has to be zero, right? The derivative of w, if w is equal to zero, its derivative is zero also. So del w del x, right? Yeah, or I guess d, oh, whatever. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, sorry, I have to be careful here. So, so let me back up one sec. Remember, if we're thinking about finding the derivative of y with respect to x using implicit differentiation, we are imagining that y is equal to some function of x, right? That is true. So I shouldn't be writing del w del x, I should actually be writing dw dx because it's really just all a function of x at some level. Um, you could make a picture, it'd be kind of weird. The picture would look like, have it here. Yeah, so the picture for, for w equal to f of x comma y, well, there are functions of x and y, and then x is a function of x, which is not very exciting, and y is also a function of x. Okay, so looking at this here, yeah, okay, cool. This is going to work out totally fine. So del w del x which is definitely, sorry, dw dx, which is definitely zero, is going to be, well, using my chart, it's going to be the derivative of f with respect to x times the derivative of x with respect to x, which feels dumb to write because it's just one, plus the derivative of f with respect to y times the derivative of y with respect to x. And that's going to equal zero. But then check this out. Yeah, this is cool. It's like, I know how this works for sure. We can solve for that and look what we get. 
we get Fy times dy dx equal to negative f of x times one, right? So I'm going to subtract that over there. Sorry, negative f of x, not f of x. And then divide by fy. Oh, yeah, check it out. So it really does work. OK, enough of that. I've said too much about that. It might come up occasionally. It's cool. It's way faster than using the long version of implicit deprecation, but it is. It's something that you don't like. You have to remember. To, if you haven't seen it in a while, you might not think of using it. So that's there for you if you have to do implicit. And again, you, here. Oh yeah, there's the attendance document again. Okay, James. Um, I think in one of my homework problems that I turned in this week, and there was an example like this in the textbook. They told us that we had to use this method of implicit differentiation. They said like, oh, just use equation five. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you can make a video like that on YouTube or like this. Yes. Sure. Totally. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So like a, a problem similar to this where we where we just did like this here. Yeah, but the thing that kind of threw me off was there was a natural log in there, so I was like, okay. yeah. yeah. I can definitely make an example like that. Okay. Thank you. If you don't mind, send me an email just to remind me to do it. Otherwise, I might forget. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, so moving back over to directional derivatives, I'm going to remind you guys of the important things about directional derivatives. So again, we're taking the directional derivatives of some function, usually of x and y, at some point. in some direction. I mean, I should actually call this p x dot y dot. Um, and so the thing is, I usually think about the direction being just any vector, and then I normalize the vector. So usually some people be like, oh, the vector is just a unit vector, and we'll just always say that. But what we really always are going to do is just normalize the vector. Where u should be a unit vector. And if it's not, we make it into one. OK. So then a couple things. The directional derivative is just equal to the gradient of f evaluated at the point that you're at on the surface times, uh, or sorry, not times, dot product with the vector u. Or if you're writing it like I write it, dotted with the vector u divided by its own magnitude. So that if it wasn't already a unit vector, it would be now. And if it was a unit vector, you're just dividing by one, which isn't going to change anything. So it's always safe to have this dividing by the magnitude down here. Um, I should also, I suppose, mention that you don't always have to plug in this point here, right? You can just like, just like on a regular, like for example, for y equal in two dimensions for the function y equal to x squared. But you don't always have to find the derivative at a point. You can find just the derivative in general, right? The derivative is y prime over dx. So you can totally find the derivative as just a function of the variables that mean something. Um, so that's our derivative. And then a couple other things to remember. Um, sorry, what was I going to say? The gradient. Evaluated at the point is the direction of steepest ascent or increase. And if it's the if that's the direction of steepest increase, then the negative of that is the direction of steepest decrease. So I know. Um, 
Rodriguez was talking about like an ant on a plate <laughs> and it wants to cool down the fastest. That means you want the fastest decrease. So you're gonna go in the direction that is the negative of the gradient in that kind of example. And I think I have a similar example if we wanna do it. Let's see. Um, all my examples are jumbled up. One second. Okay, well, it's not exactly like that, but fine. Oh, and the other thing he said, which makes sense, is that the gradient or the direction of the gradient crosses the level curves perpendicularly. Right? So if you think about the level curves as literally different heights of the function, if you're trying to go the direction of steepest ascent, you're trying to crap cross those heights as fast as possible. And the way you cross those to higher heights as quickly as possible is to be like, by going directly perpendicularly across them. So let me actually, let me address that example first, and then we will we'll come to this other example. So I'm gonna go back to my favorite example, to the function f of x, y equal to nine minus x squared minus y squared. And let me draw some level curves to you guys real quick. So let's look at, z equal to zero, and I'm going to pick some nice numbers because I'm trying to make my life easy. Pick z equal to zero, pick z equal to, sorry, uh, five, z equal to eight, z equal to nine. So, right, if I said z equal to something, this is z equal to nine minus x squared minus y squared, adding, subtracting, So when x or plus, when z is zero, you've got x squared plus y squared equal to nine, which is a circle of radius three. As you move up to a higher height, you get a smaller circle. As you move up higher, you get a smaller circle. As you move up higher, you get a circle with no radius, which again shouldn't be surprising. We've seen this shape already. There it is, drawn really, really nicely. Right? That's our usual, and it extends further downward. But the idea is that if I draw these in just the xy plane, so circle of rating, so now I have to be good at drawing, which I'm really not. Okay, so here's from the outside in, here's z equal to zero z equal to 5, z equal to 8, and at the very, very top, z equal to 9. And so let's say I started at the point 1, 2, which I know is my favorite point. So um, uh, over here at 1, 2. Um, that's not quite on that circle, James. Fine. 1, 2 is a little higher. Apologies. I think one comma two. Oh, sorry. If x is one and y is two, then z is four. This is z equal to five. So one comma two is a little outside, it's a little bit lower. So there's one comma two comma four, right? The z value is four there. So it makes sense that it's in between the level curves z equal to five and z equal to zero, right? This is z equal to four. So what we're going to see is that at this point, the gradient should point us exactly towards the center, but it should also be crossing the level curves perpendicularly. Right? That is always going to be the steepest ascent, is crossing those level curves perpendicularly. So if I my gradient, well, this is the easy one. If the gradient's just negative 2x, negative 2y, partial of x, partial of y. If I evaluate it at the point um, 1, 2, I'm going to get the vector negative 2, negative 4. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that's enough to show me which direction I'm going. So if I start here, 
and I go negative two, negative four, I'm going exactly that way. But most people, your professor included, want you to think about it as a unit vector. So really I shouldn't be drawing it so big, I should really just be drawing a vector of length one, which would probably be about like there. Probably, I don't know, maybe not, that's not long. Um, but the point is two things. One, it is the direction of steepest descent, right? We're trying to get to the top of the hill, which is right here at the origin, right there at the point zero, zero, 009, by crossing the different heights, the different z values perpendicularly, which is crossing them as quickly as possible. So if someone asked me from this point, what is the direction of steepest descent? My answer, unfortunately, should not be the vector negative two, negative four. It should be the vector negative two, negative four normalized. Meaning my answer to this question, which I know I didn't write down. So I suppose I say the question, you know, from the point one, two, four, what's the direction of steepest descent? Well, the answer to that question, regardless of the, of the function, is just the gradient evaluated at that point. I'm just going to write this way. It's just the gradient, but you have to normalize it. So it's the vector negative 2, 4. Sorry, negative 2, negative 4 divided by the magnitude of that vector, which is just the square root of negative two squared plus negative four squared. Which you can probably simplify a little bit. That's gonna be, so this is the square root of 20, which is two root five. So it's one over two root five, negative two, negative four. Or maybe nicer, uh, cancel a two and get one over root five. Negative one, negative two. So I'll restress. Whenever you're asked for a direction, it should always be a unit vector. I don't like that personally. I would just say, yeah, they're the same direction clearly, but whatever. We will do what the people want us to do. Um, okay. Thank so, you, James. Uh, yeah. What is the point again from one comma? So it's from one comma two comma four. Two comma four. Okay. I just cannot see well from my screen. I, I'm writing, I know I'm writing a little too small. I apologize for that. Um, so let's actually ask a similar question, but for a different function. I'm going to do two things here. So maybe three things. Yeah, I got, I got ideas. All right, let's, uh, let's say our function is not too terrible. It's, what do they got here, y over x squared? No, uh, nah, that seems dumb. Yeah, that seems more fun. Yeah, yeah, sure. And we wanna find a couple things. First thing we wanna find is the directional derivative, which I'm just gonna write this way. Um, of this function at the point, so I'm going to say uh, x is negative 1, y is 3, in the direction, and I'll give us a nice normal, sorry, uh, unit vector here. Uh, let's say, I don't even know. All right, I'm going to make something up and it's like, uh, let's just do five. We'll go with the good old standby. There's a nice unit vector, three fifths, negative four fifths, right? Because I know the vector three, negative four has a magnitude of five. So I just divided by its magnitude. So if I want to find this, well, again, I'm finding this. I'm finding the gradient of f dotted with the vector u. And let's actually find, let's just find that in general and then we'll plug in the numbers at the end. So the gradient of f 
is just the dot is just the vector, so partial with respect to x. I would probably write this as y times x to the minus two to help me better differentiate. My derivative with respect to x is going to be negative two x to the negative third times y. The partial with respect to y is a little bit easier. It's just one times x to the negative second. Okay. So my directional derivative in the direction of u at any point is going to be this, which I would probably rewrite as negative 2y over x cubed, 1 over x squared, dotted with 3 fifths negative 4 fifths. And again, when you dot two vectors, you just multiply the components and add together. So I'm going to get 3 fifths times negative 2y over x cubed. Sorry, I'm writing this like it's going to be a vector. That's crazy. I'm going to get 3 fifths times negative 2y over x cubed plus negative 4 fifths times 1 over x squared. I see no reason to simplify this at this point, but you could if you wanted to. So then the directional derivative of this function in this direction at the point negative one three, well, we're just gonna plug in negative one three. So if we get, if we get this evaluated at negative one three, we're just gonna take this expression here and literally throw in negative one for x and three for y. So I'm gonna get, 3 fifths times negative 2 times 3 is negative 6 over 1 cubed plus negative 4 fifths times 1 over 1 is 1. So I end up with negative 18 fifths minus 4 fifths, which is negative 20 fifths. So what that's telling us is on this surface, at this point, negative 1, 3, in this direction, three fifths, negative four fifths. All right, so you can think about it, if you're at some point, I'm going, I'm going three fifths in the x direction and four fifths in the y direction. Sorry, negative four fifths in the y direction. So I'm going something like that, a little more down than I am going over. But from whatever point I'm at, I'm going in this direction. And when I go in that direction, I end up going down my surface, right? I'm going to go to a lower value because my derivative by steepness is negative. So that's what's happening there. Let's ask another question related to this. Um, so what time is it? Oh, sorry, I don't have my watch on. Oh, we're almost out of time. Okay, we have one more question. So let me just, well, the question I'm going to ask is easy, so let's just look forward. So I think next Monday, maybe we'll start talking about the systems of linear differential equations. It's not as bad as it sounds. It sounds like a lot. But let's say for the same, so the same function, which was, where'd you go? Y over x squared, sorry, y over x squared. Yeah. Um, what is the, in, I should say, in what direction is the maximum rate of change. Which is just a different way of asking what's the steep, what direction is there, the, is it maximally steep or is the direction of steepest ascent? So it's definitely not going to be in this direction, right? Because in this direction, we end up going downward. And it's probably going to be something really different. So again, we've got our partials, or we've got our gradient. Okay, I should say, sorry, apology. Yeah, at the point. What point were we at there? Sorry, I forgot. Negative one three. So again, we're gonna find the gradient, or we already found the gradient, which is, just use our work from before. The gradient was negative 2y over x cubed, and the other coordinate was 1 over x squared. And so if we evaluate the gradient at that point, 
Well, if I can't plug in negative one for x and three for y, I'm going to get. Sorry, I'm just thinking I made a mistake over here. I did make a small mistake over here. It's not a huge deal, but this should have been a positive six because it was a negative two times three times negative one cubed, which would give me a positive six. This is actually a positive 18 over five, and that's actually 14 over five. Sorry about that. Sometimes mistakes happen. Um, but back to this one here. I plug in this point, I get, well, I get negative six over negative one, which is positive six, and I get one over negative one, which is one. And again, to me, this is the direction, but really we know we have to normalize it. So I would say that the direction of steepest descent or the direction of maximum rate of change is exactly this vector divided by its own magnitude. Which ends up just being the vector 6, 1 divided by its own magnitude, which is the square root of 6 squared plus 1 squared, which is the square root of 37. So that direction is the direction of the steepest increase or maximum increase. Okay. So that's, I think, all we have time for today. I will definitely, um, Teresa, I will definitely try to make a video about the implicit differentiation thing, but please send me an email to remind me to do it if you haven't already, and I will make sure to get that done, hopefully sooner than later. All right, um, I forget, do you guys have a test coming up next week? Let me see here. Really. Yeah, on Friday. Let's see. Yeah. So I think yeah, you guys. So Rod Mockers on Friday. Is anyone in Carlson's class? Okay. I don't think anyone's in Carlson's class. Carlson's um, midterm was pushed back to next week. It was okay. supposed to be. No, it's in two weeks. Yeah. It's, yeah. Originally, I think it was scheduled for the twenty second, but okay, so it's been pushed back. All right, good to know. So we'll try and I'll try and give you guys something to help you prepare for. But it, I know. I, th I think, well, I actually don't know. So I'll look and see what they have posted for you guys, and I will try to give you something that is helpful for that. But yeah. All right. That's all I got. I'll see you. Thank you. you. Thank you. And please fill out the attendance form as you can.